Okay, well, uh, let's get started. It's a great pleasure for me today. It's actually a great honor to be introducing this uh, fabulous Dig Deeper webinar on collaborative planning for post mining developed in Latrobe Valley with. Okay, let's get started. So uh, it's great to be here today. It's great to be able to introduce this webinar in uh, collaborative planning for post mine development in Latrobe Valley. It's a great pleasure. And we have three fabulous speakers uh, who I will introduce in just a moment. I will do a very brief acknowledgement country on country right here. So acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands across Australia where we're meeting today for everyone, both here in Brisbane, the Yagra and Turbo people, and across where all of you are today as well. And uh, I'll also just take a note that we are recording the webinar today. There will be some opportunity for questions and answer, but actually the, the team today are going to ask some questions of you, I believe, at the end. So it's going to be a slightly different question and answer format. What I'll start by doing is introducing the speakers. So we'll just go to the next slide there. Uh, we have three speakers, Jess Reeves, who is a place-based sustainability science researcher, and you can see that she is uh, the director of the industry corporation and senior, and she's also a senior lecturer at uh, Federation University. We have Dr. Tira Ferran, who's a human geographer, and he's a senior research scientist <clears throat> with CSRO Environment in the Sustainability Pathways Program. And we also have Kazi Haq, who is also a place-based social scientist focused on citizen engagement, and he is with the Future Regions Research Centre at Federation University. So we have a great team of speakers, and I'll be handing over to Jess right about now. Many thanks, Tom, and uh, welcome everybody. Very lovely to see you all joining us today. Um, so Tom's given us the the, um, the title. Uh, what are we talking to you about today? And this is basically the project that Tira Kazi and I have been working on for the last 12 months, obviously supported by the CRC time, uh, about co-designing a future vision for the Latrobe Valley's mine lands. So I too would very much like to acknowledge, oh, I've gone to far too many slides, I've got trigger finger. Uh, I would very much like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all coming from today, but particularly uh, the Barakalong people of the Gunai Kurnai Nation where this work takes place uh, and acknowledge their uh, elders uh, past and present. So I know that many of you on the call today are very familiar with the Latrobe Valley, but for those of you who aren't, um, really, the identity of the Latrobe Valley is very strongly connected to that of the large uh, open cut brown coal mines that have provided uh, electricity uh, for the, the growth, I suppose, of, of um, Melbourne and Victoria more broadly since the 1920s, originally through the State Electricity Company. And there have been some pretty significant changes in this region going back uh, last century to the privatisation in the 1990s which saw uh, a downsizing of the workforce related to, to energy generation and coal mining uh, and the privatisation that has occurred for the three sites that have happened there and four, four power stations. It's another pretty significant events that have defined uh, both the, the region but also community participation uh, in the future of this region is particularly the Hazelwood mine fire, which occurred in 2014. This is where one of the open cut mines actually caught fire and burnt for 45 days. And just recently we've held a commemoration, uh, a 10 year commemoration of that event, which did a fantastic job at bringing the community back together and really reflecting on the, the major changes that have happened because of that and since that, such as the development of the um, Latrobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation Strategy, and really asking or requesting each of these mines to think about their closure plans. Uh, and to that end, one of the mines have now closed. The Hazelwood uh, pit has closed in 2017 and all three mines are set to close by 2035. Uh, and uniquely in Victoria, these three mines have been uh, listed as what's referred to as declared mines under the Mineral Resources Sustainable Development Regulations 2019, the amendment in 2022. 
which uh, requires each of the operators to uh, complete rehabilitation of these mines to what's referred to as a safe, stable and sustainable state before the licenses can be relinquished. So that's very much been the focus of the last uh, few years about uh, what these final landforms are going to be. So this provides both a problem and an, and an opportunity, I suppose. So whilst the region has got an, an overabundance of plans and there is a, a, a oversupply of, of opportunities for community participation, you'll see some of the plans that we've got uh, on the screen here. There's plans for transitions and there's plans for economic development, but there isn't as yet a coherent plan for what the future of these actual sites can be. Beyond the voids themselves, there is a very large parcel of land that's be, uh, going to become available. Uh, and this provides a real opportunity for, for economic development, for healing of country, for rehabilitation, and also engagement of, of the community to, to really start to craft a, a positive future. This has been somewhat stifled or, or stilted by the lack of determination about what the final mine voids will be or what the rehabilitation plan is going to be accepted. Each of the mine mines are putting in proposals for having pit lakes as part of their rehabilitation. Uh, and that has, I suppose, taken up a lot of the uh, community sentiment about what um, w how these mines should be re rehabilitated and particularly how and where the, the water comes from. But there's a real opportunity here to think too about what the rest of the land around these mines could provide. So rather than thinking about a, a risk narrative or risk mitigation narrative, we're keen to sort of expand this conversation to be one of, of opportunity. And Chris Buckingham, who's the head of the Latrobe Valley Authority, has this uh, fabulous phrase called the, the wicked opportunity uh, that these sites present. In particular for our project, this is not a solution that any one party can come up with. There are many, many actors that are involved in this space from the, the operators of the sites, various government departments, local council, uh, and of course the Latrobe Valley community and the Victorian community more broadly who have an opportunity to um, really craft what the future vision is for this site. But they need a forum to be able to come together. So this is really where our project fits in is creating a framework or a space for collaboration to emerge and, and for this project and the, th the, the framework itself to actually provide that, that leadership, I suppose, or initi initiating that leadership within the community in this collaborative space. So again, for those of you who are not familiar with the sites, this is a little snapshot of the Latrobe Valley itself. And there's a few things I want to point out to you. Uh, the brown spots are the open cut mines themselves. Uh, and you'll see they are quite large in relation to the major urban centres that we have in this area. So we have Terelgan to the east, Morwell and the Moe Nubra area. So quite large urban uh, developments in very, very close proximity in some cases to the mine sites themselves. But in terms of the footprint where our work takes place, it really is these grey areas that are surrounding the mine voids. So our project is not within the mine voids themselves, but the significant areas uh, that are currently the mine licenses outside of those mine voids. And as you can see, these are really significant tracts of lands, uh, in particular quite close to these existing urban centres. Uh, altogether, the licenses take up about 130 square kilometres of land. So the overall aim of the project is to develop, uh, it's a two-stage project. We've just commenced, uh, completed the first stage, we're moving on to stage two. So by the end of stage two, by 2025, we hope to develop a shared vision and a framework for future land use for Victoria's Latrobe Valley mine lands uh, and after coal fire power generation. So we're really looking at a long term plan, uh, much of which won't be realised for, for many decades now, but at least to have a framework to help that development. When we speak to about land use vision, we're talking about uh, the types of um, spatially explicit land uses that can be made available on each of these parcels of land. So what is the land most suitable for uh, and what opportunities does it present? Um, and we also are thinking about uh, what values that each of these land uses may uh, seek to realise within the community. The community has a lot of expectations around uh, future job opportunities, around healing landscape, around biodiversity connect connectivity and about future industry as well. So what are these values that these lands and um, future land uses 
can help to realise. Importantly, and we feel that this is something that's been missing in, in previous visioning exercises, we need to ensure that um, the things that we're proposing, particularly the things that we invite the community to deliberate on and to participate in, must be technically feasible. Technically feasible, um, preferably economically feasible as well. So this isn't necessarily completely open blue sky thinking. This is really grounded in what capacity these lands have for what types of land uses can be real, realised upon them. And by framework, we're talking about the, uh, developing a methodology, particularly looking at um, uh, methods of collaborative governance and, and deliberation, a methodology where these uh, land use visions can be formulated. In particular, how can we bring different actors together to listen to one another, to have some appreciation of each other's values, and from that, uh, help to develop a shared vision that is really owned by the community of the Latrobe Valley. And through, although this process is very much um, embedded uh, in the Latrobe Valley, we think that the process that we're going through itself uh, would be highly applicable to other, re other regions as well. Just to remind you that um, what we're reporting on today is stage one of the project, which was working very closely uh, with the operators in particular and the relevant uh, local and state government departments to see what the feasible land use options are. Stage two, which uh, commences a little later this year, is very much taking that work to the broader community and working with them quite closely about what their desirable land use options are. So this is what's possible, what do people actually want? So it's an intentionally two-stage uh, project. So just to um, introduce you a little to the methodological framework that we're using, we're very much looking at uh, a participatory deliberation with knowledge co-production. So this is quite genuinely a co-design project. Um, Tira and myself have had to go back to the drawing board a number of times and, and reframe the scope of this project. Uh, we do take our, our stakeholder input incredibly seriously in this. Um, the framework that we're using this for this or drawing upon is very much the collaborative governance conceptual framework develop and, developed by Emerson and others, which is represented in this little schematic here. Um, and we're particularly interested in looking at collaboration dynamics. You'll see some terms here. So uh, we're interested in understanding uh, principled engagement. So what is the type of behaviours between participants that allow them to be able to to listen to each other and feel that they can actively participate. Uh, we're interested in the shared motivation. What is the what is it that is wanting these people to bring together? What is their motivation for them to come together and seek to solve this problem collaboratively rather than doing it independently? But also what is required to achieve this, this capacity for joint ac action. What are the assets, the functional assets that are required to support this collaborative action? So this may be leadership, it may be institutional arrangements, it may be access to certain types of knowledge that is necessary in order to de derive this uh, collaborative dyna dynamic moving forward. So as I mentioned before, in the first stage of this project, we've been looking at the uh, capability of the land use that is available uh, and developed three exploratory, intentionally contrasting exploratory scenarios. Uh, and we've also worked with a slightly broader uh, community stakeholder group to undertake a multi-criteria analysis uh, of these different options. Um, just to have a look at this as a sort of a plan on the page of uh, what we've been doing in this project. Uh, and we can see, you can start over, we started over here very much with the values and concerns. Now, obviously, the key values and concerns that can't be removed are risk. These are quite, uh, I wouldn't say volatile sites, but um, they are technically challenging, geotechnically challenging sites. Uh, we have issues of uh, batter collapse. Um, I've mentioned the mine fire. Uh, we also have issues of subsidence in the area. So uh, for these sites to be relinquished, the risk must be managed effectively. Uh, and we also have significant costs, particularly regarding the size of these sites. But we have other values of well, as well that we want to see realised um, going forward for the future of the valley. So future employment, uh, a place that people feel comfortable and, and proud of being part of, and a range of different 
uh, employment opportunities, but also rec recreational opportunities as well, acknowledging the past, both the deep past and the industrial past as well. From this, we've come up with a series of land uses uh, that are feasible and uh, could be applied to the different parcels of land that are available on, uh, on the sites. Uh, and really looked at a suitability analysis of these. We've worked closely with each of the operators to see what types of land uses are going to be suitable on, on which portions of the land. And from these developed a range of scenarios. We co-designed these scenarios uh, with the broader uh, community group as a way of uh, them being able to vision what these scenarios would look like. We've, we've looked at uh, the three being a business as usual. So uh, what we would get if there wasn't any further visioning or investment. Uh, scenario two, which we're looking at a sort of regenerative, uh, preferencing circular economy and sustainability type scenario, which we're referring to as the bioeconomy scenario. And scenario three, which uh, is really a, a technology focused, really emphasising the energy infrastructure that we have in the area and that we're seeing develop through the, the GRES, the Gippsland Renewable Energy, Energy Zone project as well. From these, uh, we have done an assessment again with the, the broader community group, uh, applying a range of these evaluation criteria against the scenarios. Uh, and also our colleagues at the University of South Australia have uh, developed an, an economic valuation tool uh, looking at the different types of land uses and what uh, economic benefit they will provide. Now, uh, Tira is going to speak to these a little bit more in a little bit more detail when he presents the case study. So this is very much stage one, which we're just completed with what we're calling the core stakeholders. These are people with two true skin in the game. Uh, that is the operators, uh, local council, the Trove Valley Authority, Mine Land Rehabilitation Authority, and of course, uh, GLAWAC, the Gunai Kurnai Land and Waters Aboriginal Corporation. Stage two of the project, uh, we'll speak to a little bit later, uh, but this is really opening up these deliberations to three different types of community consultations. In terms of where we got to, just to report on this very quickly, uh, we've done some significant work in refining the scope of the project, uh, determined what the feasible land uses are on the, the various parcels of land that are available and developed these contrasting land use scenarios. Uh, and we've uh, compared these and, and ensured that they fit into the context of the various regional development priorities that have already been established uh, throughout Gippsland. Uh, as I mentioned, the UniSA have developed their economic modelling tool uh, and we've also done some work on reviewing uh, existing documentation and, and reports that have been undertaken on community values. So rather than uh, re-interviewing community again for what they think about these sites, uh, it really is drawing on the values that have already been uh, published in the, in the numerous reports there are. And we've undertaken this first pass of multi-criteria analysis. Also importantly, uh, we've secured support for stage two. So we're in the early phases of establishing a new steering committee for that phase of the project. Um, we're working, working very closely with GLAWAC to develop the Indigenous Community Reference Group uh, and working with various community organisations and the local Gippsland Tech School to uh, deliver those deliberation uh, projects as well and developing materials that will be suitable to translate the knowledge that we gained in the first phase to be suitable for a broader audience in the second phase. Just some high level findings that we found when we ran the different scenarios. I mentioned the bioeconomy scenario being the one that's um, very much focused on circular economy, uh, regeneration and sustainability. That rated uh, slightly more highly than the new energy scenario, but the most important finding was that it, both of these were much, much more strongly preference than the business as usual scenario. And interestingly, the participants during that workshop reflected that uh, if we don't develop a shared vision, if we don't do this work now, then business as usual is what we get. So this was really felt as a call to action for the whole community to get on board with developing uh, a vision as a way forward. We've also done some really significant work, we believe at least uh, in terms of developing the collaborative dynamics. So definitely working from the Emerson framework, but uh, Tira will talk through this in the case study a bit more, but some examples have been some very robust discussions around rescoping of the project. Uh, and in doing that, getting a greater understanding between participants of what their limitations were, uh, what their pain points were, 
uh, but also definitely gaining trust and, and a greater understanding uh, between the participant group, but also between the participants and the researchers as well. Uh, we've also done some deep learning about um, the best way to involve the, our uh, traditional owners in, in the area, uh, and we're doing some significant work with developing this Indigenous Community Reference Panel. And this is particularly because it's in parallel with work that GLAWAC are doing with regards to developing a position piece for uh, the rehabilitation of the mines themselves. Another highlight, I suppose, is the visibility that this project has gained. And a big shout out to the CRC Time for bringing their annual forum to the Valley last year. I think this was a real wake up call for the people of the Valley to realise that we're not just a little place tucked away somewhere that nobody cares about. Actually, um, the country's watching what's happening here and there's actually a great interest in, in the changes and the transition that is happening in process here. We also, uh, the, the conversations that were had at the, the Hazelwood Mindfire Commemorative Community event in February, um, was a realisation that the community is, is actually ready to move forward to develop this vision. Uh, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of mistrust, but there's also a great desire to make a better future. So that was very positive. Uh, and also the involvement of myself and, and by that through this project in the CRC in the Latrobe Valley Stakeholder Reference Group, which is reforming at the moment. Okay, so at this point, I am going to hand over to Tira, I believe. Tira, are you with us? I might just continue with this one briefly. Um, so in terms of the things that we have developed uh, through this work in terms of outputs, uh, there's a literature review that we've developed on regional development and community values, which Kazi Hark has been working on, and he'll speak to that shortly. Um, there's also a case study that Tira will be speaking to us about around the evaluation of the, the post-mine land use scenarios and the University of South Australia's economic valuation tool, which we can make available uh, in, a, in a web link to you. Uh, Kazi, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, you're on mute, Kazi. So I just uh, yes, um, it's a bit excuse me, Kazi, pop your microphone down. It's up on your headset. Yeah, yeah. perfect. Can you hear me? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the disruption. Uh, so uh, I have been working on this as part of this project. Uh, we have done this extensive literature review of the various development strategies, policies uh, that have been produced, heaps of uh, documents and thinking that have been produced by different stakeholders uh, throughout Latro and Gisland Valley. Uh, and uh, what we try to focus on those uh, literature review is that, okay, so how much actually they talk to uh, land use planning? Because there are some proposals which are not a lot, but there are some. So what are those visions and how we can draw mm -hmm. upon them for the uh, the the in, in the, the scope of our project, the wide surrounding areas, lands in the wide surrounding areas. And also we looked into the trends and drivers uh, of different economic uh, development proposals and how they talk to the land use visions, uh, the challenges or opportunities, and already like some actions and programs which are already out there, which can give some inspirations and ideas and concepts for uh, the land use planning, uh, post mining uh, use of the world surrounding area lands. And then we have also done a community values analysis uh, on these documents. So we, uh, as you can see the chart, it's a, it's a, one of the reflection. Uh, we have this uh, code list of community values developed by uh, one of our lead researchers, Tira, uh, and some of his colleagues. And we have come up with this, uh, we took some of the course from there and at least uh, on three kinds of community values, we tried to see 
in these documents. Uh, for example, here we have a comparison of uh, true reports, uh, Gibson 2035 and a lot of common division. Uh, and then we analyzed uh, uh, some the industrial sectors, uh, values associated with the industrial sectors that were in those reports and then the non-placed based uh, values and the place based values. So here you can see a chart of the some of the place-based values and how they uh, they can they they stack up in the two reports. So, for example, uh, you can see that economic value of place in terms of housing is overwhelmingly represented in uh, referred in the uh, Gibson 2035. It's about 40%. On the contrary, like uh, economic value uh, uh, in terms of entrepreneurship is uh, almost one third. Uh, uh, references have been made to it in. Uh, the latter of community vision and not so much importance to uh, economic value place in terms of housing uh, in that report. Uh, and in uh, there are also like some values which are present in one report and not present in another. And in case of some other reports, it's more it, it, uh, other values here like uh, historical or regional identity or cultural and indigenous values. Uh, they're more or less like close to each other. Uh, so I just now, uh, I think, hand over to Tira. Uh, for okay, the thanks, Kazi. Kazi, can you hear me OK? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. OK, thank you. Sorry, I, I dropped out just now, but I'm, I'm back. Um, so um, I'm going to take you through the case study that uh, we have developed in stage one of the project. So this, again, is just a summary of the, I guess, the analytic pathway that we took for a participatory multi-criteria analysis of the post-mining land use scenarios. So basically, uh, the team formulated three hypothetical or exploratory scenarios with some participant input. Um, separately, we developed with our participants a set of criteria to evaluate the relative performance of each scenario. And then uh, subsequently, we invited the participants to assign individual subjective weights to the evaluation criteria and this resulted in individually weighted overall performance scores for each scenario so i'll walk you through all of that if you could just go to the next slide please so this slide summarizes the framework that we use to develop these exploratory scenarios which are defined as plausible, intentionally provocative snapshots of future states in approximately the year 2050. And we chose uh, three uh, uncertain future states or future outcomes, if, if you will, which are shown in the first column of the table. Uh, the degree to which energy and energy related industry is concentrated in the valley. The degree to which the regional transition is socially equitable. And then thirdly, the degree to which the transition is founded on uh, principles of sustainable production and consumption. We then imagined um, three sets of stylized contrasting outcomes, which are shown in the right of the table. So, for example, business as usual, the performance with respect to those future states is relatively low, low concentration of it, relatively low compared to the other two scenarios. Um, so, for example, to put a little bit of detail on that, um, in scenario one, the coal fired power generation phases out, but the region uh, does not, for various reasons, become a significant energy hub beyond the one or two projects that have already been identified in the, in the 2020s. Uh, whereas, by contrast, in scenario three, for that uh, future uncertainty, uh, there is both new energy and fossil energy and industries are located in the region which provide energy and related goods to the national economy. So this is a real nationally significant uh, energy hub, including coal to hydrogen possibly in uh, scenario three. With respect to social equity, uh, in the business as usual scenario, that low means that provision is delivered by market enterprises. So provision of uh, water, food, energy, and housing. Consumers are exposed to price increases as costs are passed through. Uh, whereas, for example, uh, in scenario two, uh, where that social equity is imagined to be high, uh, we are the description that goes along with that. The scenario narrative is that the institutional context 
supports a variety of organizational business models, and there's greater diversity in the types and scales of delivery of how food, housing, energy, water, and transport are delivered. If you could just go to the next slide, please. So we, we then translated those qualitative statements or settings in each of the three scenarios to quantitative post-mining land use scenarios. So what this figure shows here is um, uh, percentage charts of the uh, rehabilitated mine land excluding the pit voids. So the land surrounding the pit voids has been translated under the logic and narrative of each of the three qualitative scenarios into three quantified post-mining land use scenarios. Each of the colors there represents a different type of land use. There are 13 types of land use in total. Um, in terms of how we do, did this, we um, first we interviewed each of the operators to identify site-specific uh, considerations and factors such as existing infrastructure on their site, such as transmission lines, uh, similarly biodiversity conservation zones, uh, contaminated land, existing uh, uh, commitments, for example, uh, mining coal to 2035 at Luoyang. So with those constraints in mind, uh, we had the member of the study team who was most familiar with the mine sites to allocate uh, each of the 13 types of land use among all the major parcels of the site. So we, uh, among the, across the three sites, we came up with 23 major parcels and we allocated those 13 types of land use to the 23 parcels in a manner consistent with the qualitative scenario framework I just showed. So for example, in scenario two, the bioeconomy scenario, the storyline implies that among other things, it has the highest proportion of high conservation value habitat of all three scenarios. Therefore, under scenario two, each parcel that was considered suitable received the highest allocation to this type of land use. And so following this method, each parcel was allocated up to three types of post-mining land use, summing up to 100% of the parcel area. So you'll see, for example, in this figure, this uh, green shape in scenario two at the middle, the, the light green uh, segment of the, of the uh, column chart here um, is that high conservation ecological uh, land, high conservation land. So just moving along to the next slide, please. So separately from the scenario formulation, we invited our workshop our participants in stage one um, through a workshop process to distribute uh, to to first of all to formulate a set of evaluation criteria with us. Um, and this slide gives you an example of the types of evaluation criteria that we formulated. There were a total of nineteen divided into two sets. The first set, uh, basically the, the metric is the area allocated to a particular land use. So for example, uh, if, this, if the font is not too small for you to read, you'll see that, for example, uh, for the valued outcome of market-based food security, uh, there are two types of land use uh, that are shown here on the slide. One is uh, land allocated to intensive agriculture and horticulture, and land allocated to grazing or cropping land. So those um, were two of our 19 evaluation criteria. That's in set one, and then in set two, we had evaluation criteria that, that uh, can't be measured by the area in hectares of land allocated. They are sort of cross-cutting, uh, um, they're, 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 they're indicators of, of values that um, don't, don't reduce to area allocated. So for example, um, financial security or um, uh, alternatively stated economic output, the employment in all the industries utilizing all of the post-mining redeveloped land. Uh, the metric is total employment by rank. So that's those are the examples of the set two evaluation criteria. Then just going on to the next slide, please. So um, before explaining this, uh, I should say that we invited the participants uh, with those 19 evaluation criteria that I just showed to allocate a budget of 100 points as individual participants in the project individually and subjectively to uh, allocate their budget of points to the evaluation criteria that they individually valued. And 
Once uh, you do that, then you get a distribution of individual overall utility scores. So it's basically the individual weight assigned to each criterion multiplied by the raw evaluation score. Uh, the evaluations were done separately by the research team and they were done uh, separately from the weighting. So the participants weren't aware of how these uh, scenarios perform relative to each other on an unweighted basis. They did the uh, weighting of the evaluation criteria uninformed by uh, any consideration of what these three scenarios actually delivered. And um, you'll see here then that when the weights from the participants are combined with the raw evaluation score, uh, which, which was done by the study team uh, using a rapid evaluation technique, um, you'll see a few things. So you'll see, first of all, um, a series of labels that, that basically says uni-weighted or unweighted. That means the unweighted performance of, the, of each of the three uh, scenarios. So just to be clear, I'm sorry, the figure doesn't show it here. Um, uh, scenarios one, two, and three are left to right in each of the two panels. Um, so what the, what the uni-weighted or unweighted uh, data point shows you is that um, there is an inherently superior performance of scenario two in the middle over scenario three over scenario one. So again, to remind you, scenario one was business as usual, scenario two was bioeconomy, scenario three was new energy. Um, but nonetheless, what the median of the weighted scores, that median point is showing you, which is higher than the unweighted point, and indeed the distribution of scores for each scenario is showing you that the participants assigned a more than uniform weight to those criteria in which scenario two and scenario three deliver more strongly to than scenario one. So for example, participants uh, overall on balance attached more value to things like high conservation value ecological land, as well as land uh, redeveloped for light industrial use and heavy industrial use, um, as well as uh, land uh, suitable for recreation. They assigned a more than uniform weight to those four criteria uh, for which scenarios two and three perform relatively more strongly than scenario one. Um, so this was the basically uh, the MCA technique that we used. And then on to the next slide. Um, in terms of uh, how we interpret these, these findings overall. So uh, basically we're arguing that um, the act of the joint action of producing the above knowledge that I've just summarized is a co-productive process. It has deepened collaboration. So the top panel of this figure shows the activities and outputs beginning in early 2023 at the left, establishing the research project um, to the end of 2023, producing uh, the pieces of knowledge that I've just summarized and including um, a reflection which we're now doing on the strengths and limitations of the stage one methodology. So um, along with that, uh, we believe that there has been a deepening of collaboration and that's sort of summarized in the um, information at the bottom of the slide. So um, you remember uh, just introducing the collaborative governance theoretical framework. It consists of, um, well, initially there needs to be some drivers of collaboration one of which is initiating leadership. We believe that that's been provided by Federation Uni um, and the other research partners, including uh, the key sponsors on the steering committee. That initiating leadership has allowed the project to establish itself. Um, subsequently, just referred to this um, earlier, uh, um, but in, er, already in, in, at, the, at the inception of the project, uh, there was a a debate about what the proper scope of the project should be spatially and topic wise. And as just mentioned, um, the uh, some sponsoring members and, and uh, some of the core participants um, argued that the scope uh, needed to be for various reasons um, restricted to the land surrounding the pit voids. Uh, the belief is the justification of this is that there are other um, um, 
significant policy and, and planning initiatives that were focusing on uh, the future of the pit voids. For example, the environmental effects statement that the Hazelwood mine is currently undergoing so that it wasn't believed or, or these, these uh, core participants argued that the project had more value to deliver by uh, not attempting to cover ground that was already the subject of uh, great scrutiny um, and um, sort of regulatory um, the, the use of specific policy instruments such as the EES. In, in any case, once that scope had been agreed, we were able to proceed with the knowledge co-production that I've just summarized. And in, in terms through the lens of collaborative governance, um, there was, we believe, a um, synergy between um, how people were interacting in the project with each other, the relations of trust, the understanding and, of, and tolerance of differences, of legitimate differences and in interests, a synergy between that and the ability to communicate in a way that's uh, um, referred to as principled engagement. In other words, uh, communication uh, with deliberation, uh, providing reasons for arguments, and that synergistic um, dynamic then is what allowed the um, key action of the project, which was the production of the above sets of, of uh, knowledge. So again, to, to um, remind you, uh, the project in stage one and contributing to stage two is about um, seeing whether it's possible to develop a shared vision for the post mining uh, redeveloped land. And in stage one, uh, we interpreted that as um, formulating scenarios and seeing if we could get uh, people to express uh, preference for them. Um, so that synergistic interaction between shared motivation and principal engagement has allowed this deepening of the capacity for joint action or joint capacity. And um, as evidence, for example, um, with uh, resources secured for stage two. And I believe that I hand back to Jess at this point. Thanks, Tara, very much. And I noticed that there's a question from Dave in the chat. Tom, did you want to moderate those or? Sure, so question from Dave Clark. Thanks very much, well done. Were there any major surprises from the application of and outcomes associated with the evaluation criteria and scenarios explored? If so, to what extent has this influenced the stage two desirable? PMLU options approach and project scope. So do you want to be comment to, to that one? Um, my initial response to that would be that there, there were no major surprises as such, excepting the surprise from the audience itself at the difference between scenarios two and three as opposed to scenario one, business as usual. Um, and in terms of the influence on stage two, uh, the intention is still to go forward with each of these and even um, invite those participants to help develop these separate visions a bit more clearly for themselves and then run through a similar similar process. So I, I don't think it will alter things, but Tira, did you want to add to that? Yes, thank you. So I think just briefly, I came to the realization that um, Value can does correlate with the uh, spatial extent of land that you allocate for relevant land use, right? It's, um, so that there is a relationship there, but it, it's not a reductive relationship. In other words, uh, the value that can be delivered um, is not entirely measured by the spatial extent of land. Um, there are considerations such as how well uh, precincts are designed at a smaller spatial scale that we didn't explore. And so I, I think that going forward into stage two, um, I would like to see some of that um, that type of exploration of, of um, precinct scale uh, delivery of multiple values. I think that that's uh, realistically how at the, the scale at which humans experience um, many types of landscape, perhaps not all types of landscape. Um, and bearing in mind, as, as people, some many people know that these are these are relatively large sites. There's, there's ten thousand hectares of, of of land here, and um, it people's preference for ultimately uh, the options and the composition of those options that uh, constitute the vision 
um, probably are not going to be fully um, captured by this type of um, multi-criteria analysis of the kind that I of, of the kind that we did in stage one. So we we need to uh, work more closely with maybe particular pilot parcels uh, across the three sites. So look, um, I've got a question of clarification and, and please, if anyone else has got uh, questions of clarification, pop in the chat, but just while that's coming through, I'm interested to learn a little bit more about what you're referring to a as a deepening of collaboration. Can you just talk us through that a little bit more? What was the deepening of collaboration, and um, you know where's that where's that got to? Uh, just while you do that, I'm going to monitor the next questions coming through. So I'm cognizant that there's quite a few of the participants on the call, so I'll be polite in what I how I respond to that. Um, I would say so we have as we've referred to the core participants and then the, the broader participant group and the core participants are uh, that the um, mine operators and power station operators and the, the key government departments primarily and um, and Glowak. Um, and I would say that probably since about since the development of the Latrobe Valley Regional Rehabilitation Strategy that was released in 2020, dialogue between them has quietened significantly uh, and this is particularly whilst we're waiting for um, determination about what the final mine void forms will be and so I won't go as far as to say mistrust but I'll just say disquiet between between the different parties and and the not many forums to be able to come together and really discuss these things so I think throughout the process of regularly coming together and really unpacking some of these challenges uh, has certainly built a dialogue or rebuilt a, a dialogue and a trust that might have been happening between individuals but not necessarily all together in the one space and then to be able to extend that to the next step to the the next sort of ring I suppose of of key stakeholders these are people with still got skin in the game um, with key community organizations or um, catchment management authority and other related organizations to really get an, an understanding of some of the sensitivities and what was happening because that knowledge sharing wasn't really happening uh, as clearly beforehand. And then with the hope that we then take this to the, the public uh, in the next phase. So look, a few questions have come in and I'm conscious that you also have uh, some questions for the audience, is that right? Uh, look, if, uh, we'll see how we go for time. Okay. So then maybe what we'll do is we'll just read out the three, like a few questions in a little, little batch and you can kind of take them take them together. So the first one here, were there varying levels of mine rehabilitation in the models, for example, as to whether high walls were battered down or not, or were there existing assumptions to level of mine re rehabilitation? So that's one question. There's another question here, which is how were the scenarios developed was consideration given to focus on economic areas proposed by Council or Regional Development Victoria or C4G and others, such as advanced food and fibre, defence and advanced manufacturing? And then so final question for this batch, what were backgrounds or the backgrounds of the participants in this process? Which sectors were they from? How long have they been in the area? And how representative uh, demographically were they and their experience who people who didn't work in the region? So do you want to maybe just handle those three questions as I said and sort of d divide them between between you and, and see how you go? Uh, yes, we could probably, I might answer them quickly and then get Tira to expand. Or was there any that you'd like to take in particular, Tira? Uh, so the first one, Andrew, uh, with regards to, we'll call it final mine uh, void form. Um, because this is something that's in process at the moment, each of the operators have put in their uh, preferences for final mine forms. Um, they need to submit their declared mine rehabilitation strategies by October next year. We worked on the assumption that that is what would be realised knowing that that determination had not been approved yet. Um, 
So the assumption was pitfall lakes for each site because that's what the operators are promoting. However, this is why we've intentionally gone outside the void in the buffer zone. Um, so we haven't gone to the level of detail of uh, what would property values be with a waterfront view as opposed to not a waterfront view, but just um, available land for residential, for example. So that level of detail hasn't, there's also things like water availability for agriculture that we have not factored into this level. It may come out in the next level if there's other determinations that have been made, but at this stage we're definitely staying outside of pit void, but with the assumption of, of, um, of pit lakes for each site. Uh, Georgina, hello. Um, yes, so the work that Kasi did on reviewing the economic development reports took into consideration the Gippsland Regional Development Strategy, the C4G's um, plans, uh, Latrobe City Council's visioning work um, and the work that the LVA has been doing and their areas of competitive advantage. Kasi, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so uh, as uh, uh, because we just just briefly discussed uh, shed light on that. So uh, when we uh, did the extensive literature review, so we looked into all these proposals of different economic developments, different economic development zones, different economic development projects, and uh, the sectors they dealt with, and we kind of went through all of them and compared that, okay, so in uh, how they can actually fit into the land that will be available that we are focusing on this part of the project and which kind of projects might be uh, or which kind of like uh, uh, economic development actions or programs uh, might go with this land. But of course, like we didn't, I mean, uh, our scope is not prescribing or suggesting. We just like put all the options and uh, ideas on table uh, and see, I mean, it's for the stakeholders to decide that which actually uh, uh, is most suitable. Yeah. <laughs> Tira, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'm good, thanks, Jess. Cool. And uh, Will, in answer to your question, hello, Will. Um, that question is probably more relevant for the next stage. So the next stage is when we're getting true community participants. Uh, and the intention there is to have a demographically represented representative panel of 30 people and an Indigenous uh, reference panel and a youth summit. So three separate panels, but one of them will be demographically represented. And we've started to have conversations about how we might achieve that. We've got a few different uh, methods that we're working through. In terms of the participants in this stage, it was very much people who are quite aware of in some cases intimately aware with the sites or or have um, skin in the game so such as Latrobe Health Advocate, Latrobe Health Authority, uh, Food and Fibre Gippsland, so Gippsland Climate Change Network, so organisations rather than individuals. Okay great so um, we've got about five minutes left there are two more questions which have come in in the meantime I'll just read them out you can maybe kind of handle those and then feel free to ask, ask a question if you have one. Um, so we have a question, were the participant weightings used in the analysis reasonably consistent across the participants or divided by participant background and aspirations? So we have a fairly methodological kind of, well, kind of a technical question there about, about the uh, weightings. And then we have another question here, Notice that co-design approach is applied to address PMLU scenarios. Have you considered place-based approach from Indigenous perspective? So uh, those two questions, um, over to you. Tira, would you like to take Ray's question? Yeah, so the, I guess at this point, we collected this information on an anonymous basis, Ray, so we didn't, a sign we, we can't necessarily trace uh, who holds what weight, but I agree that that would be good to that good data to collect for stage two. We may have some in indication for stage one, but I, I can't say off the top of my head whether we have a full data set there. And with yes. regards. 
to the, the yeah, thanks, Tira. With regards to the next question, uh, absolutely. With regards to to uh, stage two, um, we will definitely be taking a place based approach, certainly for the community and the Indigenous community reference panels. Uh, definitely a place based approach to um, preferred land options. Great. So. Uh few minutes left for our last question, but just you did mention a question for the audience. So did you have something you'd like to ask? I was just curious to know if other people had undergone this, uh, I'll call it an authentic co-design process um, and what their experiences have been, or is it something that is, you'd like the idea of it, but it's just too hard to go there. So I'd, I'd like to hear from anyone about they're either their experience or their, their interest in doing this kind of work. So with the available time, if someone's got any kind of immediate reactions, feel free to kind of pop them up in the chat there. Uh, but possibly if it needs a slightly longer and more considered approach, you might be one to, to follow up with uh, Jess, uh, Tia and Kazi and the team as a kind of offline after the meeting, because that, yeah, that is kind of a, so a lot in that question around what constitutes genuine co-design, what 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 makes it genuine, what makes it co-design. Uh, I like the question and I like the question on how to have how people's experiences of that, something I'm very interested in myself. So um, yeah, welcome any initial reactions, but otherwise perhaps we uh, follow off that, that up on that. Just flicked over the last two slides, Tom, if that's okay. Perfect. Yeah, uh, so we've, we've already mentioned this a little bit in some of the answers to the, the questions, um, but just in terms of next steps. So we're really excited about stage two. Um, stage one is really getting the foundations and making sure that the information that we are sharing with the broader public is uh, agreed to and accepted by the other participants. We're not going to make people uncomfortable. We want to make sure that what we're sharing is, is material that can be shared with the public and really invite them in to, to help it share this vision. So as I mentioned, we've got these three different types of deliberation, one with the representative community panel, uh, one with the Indigenous Community Reference Group and one with a, a youth design summit. Um, and just in terms of the types of work that we're trying to get out of this, what we hope to seek in stage two is, is really try this. What is the sort of forum that allows uh, all of these groups to come together and explore collaborative deliberation? We're not seeking for consensus. We're seeking to understand sensitivities and things that people are excited about um, and really move the conversation forward to uh, help develop this shared vision. It's, it keeps coming up in these conversations. What is the vision for this space? And I think we're, we're ready to do that now. Um, but also it's helping to build back some of that trust between the operators, the government and the community as well, because of those things that I mentioned right at the start, the, the privatisation, the mine fire, these, are, these have created some uh, separations within the community here and we want to see that coming back together again. And that uh, commemoration event recently was a, a fantastic step toward that. But importantly, we want to ensure that this, that this is a model that can be used in other places, hence, hence our question of, have you tried this? Has it worked? Would you be interested? And we'd be very happy to follow up with you afterwards if you'd like to uh, explore this work further. Um, and just a, a big shout out and thank you to the enormous team of people who have helped us get here. Uh, we have our official steering committee, but we have an awful lot of advisors, not all of whom I could fit on this slide. Um, this is a very generous community and we're incredibly proud and grateful to be working here. So thank you to everybody and particularly thank you to the CRC.